Thanks, everybody. This is, of, of course, I think, as I look around, all of you are, are repeat offenders. So you all know that this is part of this, the Vermont Law School Summer Series of Hot Topics lectures. Um, and we, we unfortunately had, uh, we had uh, Tony Rossman was lined up to speak today, um, but he had a medical emergency and so just was unable to do that. Um, so we're really grateful to uh, Professor Jones and to Ben Jervy for stepping in today to give their lecture. Um, but just a reminder about these lectures, if you haven't already signed the, the CLE sign-in sheet and you want the credit over by Carl, there's a piece of paper that you can sign in and, um, and get the credit. Um, feel free to eat, as some of you are already doing. Um, and there, we'll try to do this in a way, Kevin and Ben, so that there's some, some time for discussion at the end. Um, so let me just give a quick introduction about uh, Kevin, um, Professor Jones, I should say. Um, he's uh, the director of our Institute for Energy and the Environment. And um, he's also involved in a variety of other things at Vermont Law School. He's, he's uh, you know, a professor of, of multiple energy courses. He has, uh, he's been engaged with our new Economy Law Center. We were just talking about exciting new relationships we're trying to build down in Cuba and Chile. Um, he's a, a man of many talents and uh, has a lot going. Um, he's uh, got his PhD from RPI and, uh, and a master's from LBJ School of Public Affairs down in Austin, Texas, and his bachelor's from Vermont. So he's covered the, covered the spectrum. Uh, ben is um, the Climate and Energy Media Fellow right now at Institute of Energy and Environment and is looking to take over its uh, work of the climate transportation team, which is a, a kind of a cool and, and fun development. Um, he's uh, got a background as a writer, editor, researcher in, in the areas of climate, energy, and the environment. Um, I won't go into all of his background, other than that he's got, he went to Middlebury and is currently pursuing his, his um, Master's of Energy and Regulatory Law on the Institute. So they've recently written a book. Um, you want to hold it up, Ben, so everyone can see? The, the, uh, a book about the electric battery, um, which is the basis of their conversation today. So this is cutting edge stuff. I hope that you have a good time, and I'll turn it over to you guys. Thank you. Dean Mears. Um, so as, uh, as was mentioned, we were asked to pinch hit at the last minute, so you're seeing the first, uh, first performance of this presentation. So please, we'll, we'll ask for feedback at the end and, and, and suggestions for how we can continually improve it. But uh, it, we published this. Is it not close enough? Sorry. Um, is that better? I'll lean forward a little bit. Um, so we, uh, the book was published. I'm going to pull it out and talk in it like this. Is this better? All right. Um, so the book was published this spring. Yeah. <laughs> Is that right? Um, and basically, uh, Kevin asked a, a group of students to work on it uh, together. And we each uh, fielded two chapters. It was a great opportunity for us students to get involved in some serious research about um, the electric battery. and and. The theme of the book is um, how the electric battery is going to play an uh, integral role in unlocking um, this low carbon future, how it is such an essential component of a lot of our electric and transportation systems, uh, the decarbonization of them. So um, we, sure, okay, sorry. I will really, really put it up to my mouth here. Is that better? Okay. <laughs> I'm not too experienced with microphones, sorry. Um, so as uh, in the, uh, looking at the problem, the climate challenge and the problem um, and, and solutions presented by the electric battery, we can look at uh, the, the EPA's uh, inventory of greenhouse gas emissions by sector. And you, you'll note that the transportation sector and the electric generation sector um, together represent over 50% of our national greenhouse gas emissions. And these are two sectors that, that the electric battery has um, particular uh, potential for, for helping, um, for helping uh, decarbonize. And, and um, 
as we will 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 show through this talk, uh, that some of this stuff is happening right now, and some of it's going to happen very quickly. Um, just to provide a bit of context, we can look at the technical definition of an electric battery, uh, as defined by uh, one of our primary resources, that the handbook of batteries. And um, basically, it's a, this is a chemical transaction happening in in the in the battery here, and we don't need to to read it or get too much into it in the interest of time, but. Um, figured it was worth defining. Um, and in the book, we present a very brief history of the battery. Um, it was uh, that the, the first thing resembling a battery was uh, created by a Dutch scientist, um, Peter von Muschenbroek. Um, pardon my pronunciation to any, any Dutch in the room. But uh, it was basically a glass jar filled with water, lined with metal foil, with a nail protruding out of the lid. And um, it delivered a considerable shock to the first experimenter who ever uh, 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 discovered it. And that was it. One shock, done. It wasn't a consistent source of energy, um, but it was the uh, the the real um, it was the first uh, breakthrough in um, in in the actual sort of chemical technology. In 1800, uh, Volta, whose name um, obviously became the namesake of the Volt, um, he stacked a bunch of discs, uh, zinc and copper, together and created what was then known as the voltaic pile, which is the really true first electric battery. It could con deliver continuous electrical charge. Um, and within months of Volta making this discovery, they were powering lights in London. And, um, and, and it really took off quite quickly. Um, over the next century, um, sort of proceeded in fits and starts. Um, first, well, it got its name, the electric battery. And um, to see, let's see, does anyone have want to venture a guess on who n named the battery? I'll give the hint that it is a name that is often the answer of, uh, <laughs> of who invented something in, in the United States. No, but one of the other small handful. earlier. Franklin, whoever said Franklin. So Benjamin Franklin, um, we'll read this passage real quickly because it's great. Um, he was writing a letter, in a letter to a friend, um, described a machine, which was essentially a battery, upon which we made what we called an electric battery, consisting of 11 panes of large sash glass armed with thin lead, leaden plates pasted on each side. And he derived the term battery from the French word battery, which then des described the military formation. And it was essentially a number of things working together in, uh, in, in, um, in partnership. So um, over the next century after, after Volta really pioneered it and Franklin named it, uh, a couple of French inventors created the first rechargeable battery and the first dry cell battery um, around the mid-century was the removal of all f uh, free liquids uh, that made the dry cell battery a, a big innovation. You no longer had these like soaking buckets that were basically batteries. Um, and then around the uh, turn of the century, the National Carbon Company uh, commercialized the dry cell under the Columbia brand, which you see up here. And uh, you may not recognize the P Columbia brand, but you will recognize uh, th what they became, which is uh, Energizer. And um, this isn't this brief history isn't really just to show you the neat pictures that we turned up in our archival research, but also to point out that um, these periods of battery innovation have happened um, in little bursts uh, in around the, the turn of the 20th century, for instance, mid 19th century, and before that at the turn of the 18th century, and we seem to be at a, one of those points right now where there are dozens of new chemistry technologies and, and a handful of um, really exciting battery innovations that are happening really right now. So, um, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Kevin for a bit. Okay, in one of our chapters, we talk about some of the leading battery um, chemistries. And one of the benefits of working with some of the great diversity of students we have here at VLS is um, one of our co-authors, Sarah Barnowski, came to us with engineering degrees from MIT and Stanford. You've probably heard of those, those institutions. And, and Sarah did a lot of our research on battery chemistries. Obviously, the, the main chemistry that, that um, um, current technology focuses on and, 
and is um, leading this revolution forward is the lithium ion um, battery. Um, but um, it, for anyone interested, you can read more about it um, in the book. In terms of some of the challenges, one of the things with, ele with electric battery and one of the challenges for people to understand some of the limitations of it is that there's just a number of different factors that you really need to look at in terms of um, usefulness of the battery, in terms of um, powering our economy. And one of those is essentially the amount of power that you can get out of the battery in megawatts. The other one is the duration of um, the discharge of the battery and the number of megawatt hours that you can get from the battery. And we'll, we'll um, put that to some real life applications um, in a few minutes. And then finally, there's, a, there's another um, category of depending how you use the battery, the cycle life, and how many times can, can I charge and discharge the battery and have the battery still be useful um, for us. And, and um, um, this, this chart shows some of the different um, battery chemistries as well as some of the other alternatives to batteries, which Ben's going to talk about later. And uh, there, there is, you know, historically been no silver bullet, um, but the lithium ion batteries um, today in terms of both being able to provide um, significant power output to be able to provide significant number of megawatt hours and in, in, in to have a useful cycle life are, are um, what's on the, the leading edge right now. Um, we want to talk a little bit about um, next about how the battery is um, helping a low carbon economy and, and so we're going to talk a little bit about transportation and then we're going to follow that up with discussions of battery for behind the meter um, uses um, in homes and businesses and then we're going to talk about the battery on, on the grid level. Um, when we're talking about electrifying mo uh, mobility, um, one of the important differences um, with the electric car versus the internal combustion engine is that, you know, given the decades and decades and billions and billions of dollars of input that we put into research and development for the internal combustion engine, we still have run into this physical limitation where it's essentially 30%, r roughly 30% efficient. And the way that we've made cars more efficient historically um, is not necessarily by leaps and bounds improvements in in the internal combustion engine but we've made you know we've tended to make our, our, our more efficient cars um, you know lighter and um, in some ways less safe um, for people until we came up to um, hybrid engines and the use of um, the electric motor which um, can operate at a at a level of um, around 95 percent efficiency and and as you all are aware, um, and from our own experience here at VLS and the cars showing up in our parking lot, there's a whole variety of cars out there now from the, the, um, the plug-in Prius, um, Chevy Volt, Nissan Leaf, um, all of which are, are owned by some of our faculty and students. And uh, we occasionally see some of the Tesla models out here. And uh, um, that bottom picture on the bottom is, the, is a picture of, um, of the Chevy Volt. Um, which is my car. Um, when we look at the benefit of the battery in terms of low carbon future, one of the key things is, is where you plug the battery in because really it's a source of electric generation um, that determines um, the, the cleanliness of the battery. And, and one of the good things here in New England, um, we have one of the, the cleaner power mixes given a, a lot of hydro and, and nuclear um, in the mix in terms of um, carbon output as well as growing renewable energy. So when you plug in in New England on general, um, uh, an EV is, is like driving an 83 mile per gallon car, um, which um, certainly is better than anything else um, on the market. Uh, and one of the inter interesting things is because of um, the, the um, nature of the electric grid, and, and it's a very capital intensive um, industry, and one that is significantly underutilized, if we, um, there, there are a number of studies out there, including one that I often refer to with, from Pacific Northwest Natural Laboratories that suggests that you know, we could use existing electric infrastructure and um, um, electrify 70% of the needs of our light duty fleet um, without building it out at all, as long as we use um, smart charging and, and time of use rates um, to do so. So we can, you know, the, the electric vehicle can, can take advantage of, of our existing infrastructure um, very readily. And when we look at the electric battery, um, there's a couple of, of things that we focus, a number, a lot of things, different things we focus on in the book, but um, some of the things that, that are important to, to understand is that the battery is the single most expensive component of the electric vehicle. So um, battery advancements um, from the cost perspective are, are um, important, um, also from the performance perspective. And as, as we, we mentioned, the, the lithium ion battery remains the predominant technology for transportation. Um, generally, we use about 60 to 70% of the battery 
um, capacity that we have on the cars, and, and the reason for that is to, um, to preserve the cycle life. To, um, if we discharge um, a battery, like if you discharge the 60 kilowatt hour battery on the Chevy um, Bolt totally every time, you're gonna reduce the useful life of the battery, and so the automakers are very careful in managing it and, and making sure that you don't um, fully discharge um, the battery. One of the interesting things that they found over time is that people don't tend to discharge their batteries fully. We all have sh lots of short commutes, and, and so um, um, the automakers have been getting, um, expanding this level a little bit and, and letting the consumer use um, a bigger share of the battery um, because they, they, they're um, relatively confident that it's not impacting the cycle life. And then when we talk about EVs, you know, um, um, so, you know, some people have asked me, and, and I'm sure Ben's gotten the same question with uh, uh, the e-Golf that um, he drives. And it's like, well, you know, um, what kind of miles per gallon do you get with it? Well, we don't, I, you know, I don't use any gas, um, and so we have to look at different um, um, quantifications. But EG, EVs can generally travel somewhere between three to five miles per, per kilowatt hour of charge. Um, and actually, that photo is, is of the undercarriage of a Tesla um, Model S, and the batteries are built in the, into the, the undercarriage. And in, as, the, as we all know, the Tesla Model S was um, developed specifically as an EV. Some of the other important issues around um, EV batteries are um, weather, um, top, topography, driving habits, and the efficiency of the vehicle. Obviously, if it, colder weather um, can impact the range of the vehicle, um, rain can impact um, the range of the vehicle because you're using um, windshield washer, washers, your defoggers, but also impacting the coefficient of drag um, on the vehicle, which is very important. And um, 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 topography, obviously mountainous areas, um, when, you're, when you're going up, you're going to use more battery range, but when you're going down because of the regenerative nature, you're going to actually regenerate um, some of that. Um, as an example, um, actually this um, battery um, pack here is um, from the Chevy Bolt. And the Chevy Bolt has a 60 kilowatt hour battery that is now rated for 238 miles of range and a, and a relatively high um, coefficient of drag of, of 0 0.32. Um, when I first saw this, I thought that the Chevy Bolt was, you know, that Chevy had, had um, maybe erred in their designing of the car. But one of the things that Chevy has done is design the car for comfort, usability, and um, performance on the EV side. And... Uh, um, they're getting rave reviews um, given what they do. The Tesla Model S, as you'll, or the, even the Tesla Model E, uh, Model 3, um, which is going to be is their, their new vehicle they're bringing out, the affordable, um, around 250 mile range, has a much sleeker look to it and a much better coefficient of drag. Um, but um, um, Chevy um, made those changes um, in, in ways that, that I think are going to improve people's um, adoption of the car. And one of the goals that DOE has out there in some of their research is, is having the size and weight of the battery while quartering, um, quartering the production cost. And so those are some of the goals in terms of battery research. And um, finally, one of the questions, w whether we're talking about life cycle cost of the batteries or um, the, the, the cost of um, disposing um, of batteries um, once they're um, um, reach their useful life. One of the things automakers have been looking at is the fact that, that there's really a second life to auto batteries. Once you maybe have used a car for nine or 10 years, um, you may have significant, uh, a significant reduction, maybe 10 to 20% in the range of the vehicle because of the constant cycling and uh, the impact on lithium, lithium ion batteries. And so one of the things that automakers are looking at is what can we do with those batteries when they're done? And so this is an example of what BMW was looking at doing with their BMW i3 batteries, where a customer could essentially take the batteries um, out of their car, um, have them reformulated into um, a unit that could go hang on the wall of their garage and provide backup power and other utility services. Now for probably, you know, maybe another 10 years, because in terms of backup power performance and performance on the grid, um, you don't, um, the range of the battery in terms of transportation is, is, is a very different issue. So. Um, that's both um, providing a, a use um, for um, batteries coming out of people's cars and also um, reducing the life cycle cost of the batteries. And we also write about a lot of other transportation there. This is the Proterra all-electric bus. It can travel 350 miles on a single charge and is rated for 22 miles per gallon um, E, which is, is the, the EPA way to um, turn um, electric vehicle performance into a mile per gallon rating, and, and it compares to diesel buses of around 
miles per gallon. So we can see the incredible increased efficiency. And um, Proterra is um, building a lot of these buses in their cities across the U.S. That are, that are purchasing these. And I, and I think that the electric um, bus is going to be one of the things that's going to put um, um, diesel out of business first in terms of um, um, the bus um, form of transportation, um, given the fact that over the life of these vehicles, um, not only do they reduce emissions, they're quieter, they're cleaner in the urban environment, but um, their operating costs are significantly, different, um, significantly reduced from the diesel um, buses. And now we want to just talk a little bit about batteries for home and business storage um, on the customer side of the meter. And uh, um, the battery can provide a whole host of different um, functions um, um, in, in people's homes. This is a, a picture of a, of a Sonnen battery, a German battery, but very similar to the um, Tesla power walls. And there's a whole bunch of things that people can do with these batteries. One is um, with time use rates um, in place in places like California's, um, customers can use these batteries to essentially store battery, um, store electricity when prices are lower um, because of all the solar and wind on the system and um, um, use the batteries to discharge power and, and reduce um, demand on the system and, 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 and save um, dollars um, during periods um, largely as the sun goes down, but um, peak demand is still relatively high. And, and um, other um, other uses um, can be for um, backup energy storage. Um, the original um, power wall that came out to, to great um, um, press and promotion um, by, by Tesla um, had some significant limitations. Um, this is actually a picture of the power wall too. For those that saw the power wall one, it, this does not look quite so well designed or sleek, but it performs in, um, so much better. The, the previous power wall um, was very limited in terms of its ability to um, um, uh, manage a household load. I mean, it might, might keep your lights on and your internet service and maybe your refrigerator running, but if you have a well pump or you know um, heating uses or other things, the Tesla wasn't Tesla power wall wasn't rated for that. And it might you know at best keep the average home going for you know maybe half a day at um, at best. Um, Tesla um, discarded the power wall to one very quickly and increased both the uh, the kilowatt output of it, so um, it can um, pretty much run a medium sized home now and and possibly um, run it for a day. And and for those that um, um, our GMP customers here in Vermont, you might have seen the, the incredible um, opportunity that GMP is providing in terms of, of um, customers being able to lease the Powerwall 2 for $15 a month um, um, and own it after um, 10 years. In addition to the Powerwall, this other photo on here is a picture of um, a Sunverge um, unit. Um, this one's out in California um, with uh, Sacramento Municipal, Municipal Utility District. It can provide some of the same um, features as as the power wall or the, the Zonin, but um, on a larger scale basis. And this unit is also being used in New York City with a pilot that they're doing there where they're um, investing in demand side um, and clean energy technologies to um, um, put off building a, a, a multi-million dollar, uh, multi-billion dollar substation in Brooklyn and Queens. And these batteries can be used together as, as what's called essentially a virtual power plant where the utility can um, 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 store energy in the battery and during um, peak load times um, on the substation or um, in the area um, um, manually or automatically control um, the batteries for discharge to, to reduce the load on the system. And in terms of the, the grid storage level, um, one of the things we want to, and Ben's going to talk about some of the other um, options um, for, um, for grid, um, alternatives for grid storage. But um, the, the battery's a pretty small um, contributor today. Um, largely, um, this chart on the left is, um, you can see that pump storage hydro provides almost all of the um, grid-connected electricity storage, and in, in, in batteries are um, a very small piece of the pie, but they're growing um, very quickly. Some of the uses for doing that, um, this top picture, once again, is another interesting use. This is um, BMW, once again, um, working with um, Bosch and a utility in um, Germany where they've taken 2,600 battery cells from 100 vehicles and connected it to the grid, and it can provide two megawatts of capacity to support the grid. And once again, a second life use um, of, the of the car batteries um, to um, provide grid level storage. And the, the um, picture at the bottom is um, of a little case we wrote up on AES Laurel Mountain battery storage, um, which is out in uh, 
West Virginia and AES um, um, Battery Storage, which is one of the large grid storage um, companies out there, um, built this um, battery unit next to their wind farm and it's providing what's called frequency regulation of the PGM market. So during times where um, prices um, for electricity are very high and there's a, there's a need for very quick injection of energy in the system, potentially when the wind stops blowing and um, you lose the, the benefit of the renewable energy on the system, the batteries can be a source that provide um, very high quality frequency regulation because they can provide a lot of energy very quickly um, to the grid and thus get paid a premium for that. Um, the PGM market, which is in some of the mid-Atlantic states, um, is actually attracting a lot of investment for um, grid battery storage. And I'm going to turn it back over to Ben to talk about alternative forms of storage. Sure. And we will be quick to leave time for questions, but um, we, uh, in many of the experts we've talked to while working on the book, they, uh, while our focus was on the battery, and, and we kept hearing about how we need to do more about the existing and alternate forms of, of electric storage, um, such as pumped hydro, as, as, as Kevin indicated earlier. Um, it's true that the falling costs of batteries may make a lot of these obsolete pretty quickly, but right now they are all kind of vying for market share. And pumped hydro, um, as that pie chart showed earlier, has the, the, the vast, vast majority, over 99% of grid level storage is happening with pumped hydro. And you can see a picture of it up there in the top left. That's at the Allegheny River in uh, Seneca, Pennsylvania. Um, basically, they take electricity when it's cheap and pump it up the hill, pump the water up into that reservoir that's up on the mountain there, and then they run it down through penstocks, turning turbines like a typical hydro project uh, when they need the power. So um, it's in uh, that is the oldest and sort of crudest and uh, most well utilized form of energy storage um, out there on, on the grid. And even globally, it's, it's, it's far and away the leader. Um, some alternative forms that are in the uh, development stage right now. On the top right, you see something called compressed air. It's a similar principle in that they take energy when it's not needed, take electricity when it's not needed. They use it to run some pumps to compress air in a large tank like this. Uh, and then they, they release the air back through some turbines, spinning a generator and producing the electricity when they do need it. We are seeing some of these compressed air um, installations paired with uh, like wind power in Texas. Uh, there are a couple model projects, um, a couple demo projects underway right now. Um, so grabbing the intermittent resource when it's available and then storing the, ener the electricity as compressed air to be released when the power is needed the most. Um, on the bottom right here, if we go clockwise, you'll see a train um, that's near, that's in the mountains near Las Vegas. This is a demonstration project for a, um, a, a new evolution, I would say, of um, like the pumped hydro process. They're basically using a train and uh, replacing the water with uh, heavy, dense rail cars. And they pump these, they, they, they run these trains up the hill, a five mile track right now in the mountains outside Las Vegas. Um, and they, they pump that train up the hill when they have the excess power and then release it and grab the energy off the, off the wheels, uh, the regenerative brake function off the wheels when, uh, when they need the power. And, uh, and on the bottom right, or I'm sorry, the bottom left uh, is a flywheel. A flywheel is essentially a, uh, it's a really dense um, matter that, that spins, a spindle. Um, and they, they enclose these in vacuum uh, in, you know, vacuumed containers so they can spin really, really efficiently and it can speed up and slow down. Um, and we're talking about tens of thousands of rotations per minute. So these are spinning at incredible rates. And typically these are used more for grid support um, means like frequency regulation and we won't get into all the technical details of it but but they hold energy in the form of the spinning mass and then they just grab a little bit of energy off it when they need it and and they slow ever so slightly and um those are some of the alternate forms that are that are uh vying with the batteries mostly the lithium ion at this point um that are that are vying for to to grab some market share and should we get into policy or should we just go to question? Would you like to? Um, 
So um, as part of the policy in this, you know, one of the things that we concluded was that the technology is is really there, and you know, we know the answers. We know how to do this. We know how to produce the renewable energy. We we um, have storage technologies. The batteries are are working very well, um, but um, 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 because of the lack of public policy, we're not we're not maybe moving as aggressively as we should, quicker than I think some of us would have thought we would have in in this marketplace a few years ago, but not not as fast as we need to meet that climate challenge that Ben talked about. So some of the things that we talked about as we were writing this book, which we completed around um, September, right before the presidential election, and, and we were very optimistic, and so we had the Paris Agreement, you know, where we're lecturing ourselves on how to end fossil fuel subsidies and, and how um, Obama's um, expansions of the CAFE standards were gonna help, you know, promote the electric vehicle and the clean power plan, and we turned the book in, and, and um, well, we were a bit surprised. Um, and we had a different outcome to the election. So in, in November, I think we, we did a little rewriting um, to our final chapter um, um, and toned down some of our optimism there. But, but there still was a lot of optimism and there's still a lot of interesting things happening there and, and from what we're saying. And, and uh, um, first of all, what's happening in the states? And, and California, obviously, you know, leading the charge forward with their energy storage mandate. You know, gigawatts of energy storage are gonna be built in California because of, um, of of the legislature, governor, and, and public utility commission all um, promoting um, leadership. Their EV leadership is, is, is driving. The reason we have the Chevy Bolt being built today is because of the leadership of, of California and then the other states have adopted the California car standard. And then uh, multiple other incentive programs and um, things like the, the, um, the SGIP incentives and their smart electric pricing. And then um, just as we were actually completing the book, we had some interesting things happen. Massachusetts came out with a proposed um, storage mandate, and New York has followed up with that, with a storage mandate. So we're doing some wonderful things. And, and in 2016, New York City Mayor um, announced the, the nation's first citywide electric storage target. Um, and having just been down there recently, um, one of the challenges they're having is that the fire department won't um, approve lithium-ion batteries in the big um, buildings yet, so they're trying to work through that. But there's a lot of excitement in New York City, not both about um, renewable energy, but um, battery storage. And then more recently, we've had Volvo announce that it will stop introducing new gas only mod uh, models beginning in 2019. And just about a week ago, France announcing to end um, the sale of gasoline and diesel vehicles in 2040. Um, and uh, Norway had previously um, said they want to accomplish that similarly by 2025. So um, we can now take some questions. Um, but a uh, uh, question, um, what's, could you just explain the storage mandate, how that policy works? Well, well yeah, so, so in, in California, it's, it, I mean, the, the different states, it's a little bit, a little bit different, but, but California has mandated its utilities procure a certain amount of megawatts of, of storage capacity. So um, with the, while the utilities have procured it, they've largely done it by competitive bid. So it's not, um, not utility developed. Um, but um, utility um, um, initiated. And so there's been a lot of very exciting things in California in terms of, and we write about some of the things, um, STEM, um, and then some non-battery storage things. I, the ice bear is one of the things that Ben writes about, which is essentially using ice storage to, to um, um, provide demand management for commercial and now residential, because they have an addition to the ice bear, they now have the ice cub. Um, but um, it's a, um, really a mandate coming out of um, the state government that has been implemented by the utilities largely through competitive bids, and I think that's how probably how it works in the other states. It's in, it's a subject right now in Massachusetts um, because they are writing their storage mandate rules right now and just unveiled them. And I believe it was three thousand megawatts um, by a certain date, probably twenty twenty. So all the utilities in Massachusetts together have to go out and and grab that much megawatt capacity from usually independent. Um, independent companies that will bid into those RFPs and and then it's there on the grid and the utilities can start you know figuring out how to use it and they will they will you know uh, the the intent is to sync up solar and and wind with the demand curve with when people actually need it so Sounds good. Oh. Um, <coughs> it's it seems like we're seeing almost a tidal wave of very exciting news coming out. And uh, I've recently watched a, a piece of Emery Lovins saying, you know, don't argue with anyone about any of this stuff because basically the market is going to change everything. And I know about two weeks ago it was announced that 
Tucson Electric just signed a 20-year power purchase agreement for basically three cents a watt for the solar and 4.5 cents a watt for the battery backup. So this is, you know, and now in California, coal is dead and even natural gas is on the ropes. At the same time, beyond, and actually Volvo announced that two years ago that they were going to stop, there are going to be more than 143 models, the majority of which in Europe will get 500 kilometers, more than 300 miles of electric range by 2022. So the, <laughs> it's like the momentum, like your battery in the, there, it's huge. Now, so I keep coming back to concern, and I know that Kevin was very interested in community solar and stuff. How we're going to, okay, in this, how, wh what are we doing to produce the electricity in responsible ways? Are we still concerned about renewable energy credits is one question. Second one is, is Green Mountain Power really a fair player? Or have they figured out a way to make the customers pay for infrastructure so that they can save hundreds of thousands of dollars in by drawing on your Tesla Powerwall that you're paying for and not, you know, in other words, I'm, and, and I'm wondering too, my final question in this series is what about electrical co-ops and breaking GM power by creating you know, like now in Brooklyn, they've got a, a little microgrid that started off with 20 homes. Now it's up to 50 homes, and they're going to scale to 300 homes. That is part of that project to basically prevent having to build the the the, the substation, the multi-billion-dollar substation in Brooklyn. But what can we do? What advantages do we have in small towns? I'm a member of the Bethel Energy Committee. What are our possibilities in terms of creating microgrids, using storage, using rooftop solar, using community solar, to basically start truly decentralizing the generation and the management of power? I'll take the first one. Uh, renewable portfolio standards and RECs. Yeah, they still matter. No, it, um, and I'll, I'll more seriously though, yes, uh, that the renewable portfolio standards will still drive the um, the generation side of things, and and batteries aren't considered a generation source, so they they don't play into that. So we still need to generate the electricity in you know climate friendly, carbon free means. Um, the batteries just help enable that by helping sync it up to when the customers actually need the power. Um, Boy, we could go for for out. Maybe we should grab lunch after this if you want to get into some of the other and into the more nuanced parts of it. But and I think what you what you led with saying, I think, is is. Uh, that the markets are moving that way, and I think that um, the policies still play an, a, a critical role on on the uh, generation side. But yeah, it, it, everyone is talking about how these markets are going to move. There was just a study out a couple of days ago saying that the U.S. still will meet its uh, Paris Agreement targets just based on market activity alone, just based on the market, you know, moving towards cleaner uh, transportation and cleaner electric generation. Um, and I th think that utilities are going to increasingly feel the pinch and need to figure out how their business models can coexist with energy storage and, and with rooftop solar and electric storage because uh, otherwise uh, battery prices are going to be cheap enough soon, along with photovoltaic prices, are going to be cheap enough pretty soon that, that simply disconnecting from the grid will be a viable option for a large percentage of the population. And if the utilities don't figure out their value in providing that broader grid, then then I think there's, you know, that they're they're in for some trouble. But Kevin might have a different answer. We probably should clear all those questions. Lisa had, Lisa had her hands up early too. EMP. Um, that's a longer answer. But one thing I will say, I think I think um, you know the. Um, the the Powerwall the Powerwall one pilot that they had I, I, I think you know um, I was extremely skeptical about and you're reading the book about that but um, 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 I am one of the people signed up 
or their Power Wheel 2 Pilot, because it is a, it, I can say from a customer, it is a sweet, what Tesla and GMP are doing is a sweet deal. Um, there are all, all kinds of other policy discussions below that, but it's a, it's a wonderful deal. Um, the interesting, I mean, it's, it's the, the basic, what GMP is going to do, and one of the things for them to get value out of this is that they're going to they're have control of the battery, so they can do things like, like use the battery to bid into the, the New England markets and generate some revenues, reduce um, costs to, to um, Vermont customers, and you agree to give them access to that. What GMP will um, also agrees to do is during um, um, weather events and times where you'll need, likely need backup storage in your area, that they will leave the energy in the battery for you to, for you to do that, and that's, that's to me the great, you know, the great value of, of cost for customers in Vermont where we don't have very good time use pricing um, for that. So you get really cheap, really efficient, really quiet, really clean <laughs> um, backup storage for a very, uh, 13, I think it's $1,300 if you wanted to buy the battery um, yourself just to let GMP use it um, during periods of time when it's not of great value to you. It's a, it's, it, it's a very good customer program. My understanding is that well, Tesla's doing all the install, and Tesla, it's, it's, um, they're, they're going to do the first 500 Powerwall ones starting in August, and then they're going to go through the, the list. So it's just, um, um, it's just program implementation. But um, I, I don't know. But GMP, uh, Tesla, tes Tesla's covering all that as part of the. It's like I said, it's a sweet deal, and we, we can, we can talk more after um, if, if others are interested. It's made by Tesla, which now owns Solar City also. Hi. Whoop. Oh, it's on. Um, I think. We're preaching to the choir here, which is great. There's everybody here really cares about this issue and really cares about um, how electric batteries can be applied. So I ask this in a really friendly, supportive way. Um, I did research on buying a new car recently, and I ended up buying a Subaru because Scientific American and lots of other data that I found, including Wired, persuaded me that right now it's not really a good idea. So. If they're wrong, tell us about that, or point us in the right direction. And if they're right, uh, and if they're not wrong, how do, how do we get the information out that Scientific American is wrong? Well, I guess the first thing I would say is that, you know, I mean, for anyone, you look at, you know, Vermont, you look at, you look nationally, you look at international, and, and, and what, what France has announced and what Norway announced before is the only way meet, we meet in air carbon goals is to get rid of the internal combustion engine as a form of transportation. So, so it's a right um, to, to transition to electric vehicles. There's still like um, other battery storage or, you know, can be if, you, if you're just looking at price, for example, or maybe you're looking for affordable um, four wheel drive in Vermont. Um, um, there, there are issues where it may not, may not work um, today for everybody, but. Um, so, yeah, the materials and rare earth metals, um, for instance, have gotten a lot of attention, and rightly so. And um, we are not going to stand up here and argue that that uh, the mining of uh, cobalt and um, lithium and cerium and some of these rare earths that go into these are, are done in a way that's clean or, or great for the people who work there. Um, that's an economy-wide problem, though, I would argue, and not just an electric vehicle-related problem. Um, your laptop there has rare earth materials in it, sorry to report, but so does every cell phone that we have. Um, the volumes we're talking about for a massive expansion of EV uh, market, of course, would be considerable, and that is a problem that definitely companies like General Motors and Tesla and um, Volkswagen and um, you know the European companies working on this, they need to clean up their supply chain, there's no question. But it is an economy-wide problem. And one I would just point out that um, there are also rare earth metals, such as cerium oxides, dusted onto the catalytic converter of every internal combustion vehicle. 
um, which you don't hear from uh, some of these groups that are making some of these uh, anti-EV talking points. Um, also, there are rare earths used in the very process of refining crude oil into gasoline. So um, that you, when you hear the rare earth attacks on EVs, you're, you're definitely hearing a kind of focused, uh, focused um, a attack that's one-sided, I would, I would say. You know, just we, we didn't talk about it much, but we do have a. Ch it was very important to us to do a chapter on life cycle cost, and so we have we do have that in the book. Um, actually, Sarah wrote it, and it's um, you know, I mean, the, the, our focus on that was really um, carbon reduction, and and I mean, our conclusion as as a lot of others is that the EV, um, you know, um, has a positive life cycle cost in terms of carbon reduction, and it's going to get better as we continue to clean up, you know, um, um, our sources of of energy that um, that we use to power our economy. Um, so I have two questions. My first one is, you mentioned how it has a second life cycle, and I'm wondering what's the lifespan of that life cycle? You said the first one was 10 years. Yeah, so it could be, you know, um, um, it all depends, but it could be another, uh, certainly another 10 years of use um, on the grid, or, you know, maybe another 10 years of use hanging in your garage to, to provide your backup, backup power, and that, that all adds, you know, to the positive life cycle um, analysis of the battery. And my second question is, um, do you see EVs infiltrating four-wheel drive and pickup trucks? When do you see four-wheel drive electric vehicles happening? Well, interestingly, Tesla, if you have enough money, you can buy an excellent Model S and a Model X, um, and they're, they're all they're all-wheel drive and, and probably you know, better performance than what we have um, on the market. Um, I think it's, it's, it's only, you know, we're uh, probably a year or two or more away before when GM is putting one out there, I gotta believe they're doing it. Ford has said, yeah, I think I think it's two years that they're gonna produce a, 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 S, a electric SUV. And some of the things we wrote about a little bit in there, interestingly too, and a lot of it's happening in terms of um, Chinese investment in Chinese companies and a company called BYD, but there's a lot of investment into electrifying, you know, um, um, huge like even mining equipment and mining trucks. And um, there's a, a, a strong belief that we can use um, you know, um, the electric battery very um, efficiently in terms of heavy duty vehicles in addition to buses. Yeah, it's not a power issue that electric motors are, you know, proven to be very, very, very powerful. Um, the bus we looked at, Proterra Company, is one of the, I think, the more exciting, um, one of the more exciting developments lately. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, and you step on the accelerator and these things, and you realize that that, that it's not the, the it's not an issue of power. It's an issue of just with the four wheel drive in particular. It's syncing up those two axles, and it's a very solvable, you know, engineering problem. Anyone else? Thank you. 
things were done. And you know, you've got to be a demonstrator and you do it the part, but I don't have the resources to simply go with each new generation of these things. And I think that we can see that we need to make wise choices now so that we can take the bigger steps. The Volkswagen next stop is going to be terrible with two door engines, front wheel drive, or front wheel drive and two engines. If you have a one o'clock class, you should go right now. Otherwise, let's, let's get Mark's Mark, question. Mark, Mark gets the last <laughs> question. Right. So my question, we've spent a lot of time talking about the cars themselves, but the infrastructure used to support them and charge them when you are not at your house. And there are different models available for that. I mean, California's allowing utilities to do a build out and put things in rate base. You know, what what can the, happen at the state level or the, the local level to make it so that someone who decides they want to buy a car you know, can charge at home and then know that they can find a charging station wherever they might be headed? Um, I mean, lar largely markets, you know, I mean, it, um, w while that's important to, you know, into, into consumers that aren't used to driving these cars, I mean, the cars that are coming out like a Chevy Bolt right now, that, you know, the, the, the infrastructure in other places is not really the big, the big issue. People will drive, I mean, um, uh, with something like the Chevy Bolt, you can charge at home and, and rarely, if ever, you know, um, may need to do the, the outside charging. By having employers like VLS and what we're doing, um, providing um, charging infrastructure that 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 is do, that um, is is moving it forward, but a lot of other I mean the auto companies like GM are not really investing in that kind of infrastructure like like Tesla did because because um, um, with a with a longer range batteries it becomes it becomes um, less of an issue. Um, in California, one of the things that they tried to originally do is to keep the utilities out of it because um, they wanted to um, have third party providers and and they found that that didn't. Um, work very well because the business case for putting in EV charging is not really um, all that strong right now. So now they've opened it back up and, and are letting the utilities play a much bigger role. In places like um, Norway, which leads in, in EV adoption, 20% of every new electric vehicle purchased is an EV in Norway. One of the things they did is to use a state, um, um, state authority to go out and put the infrastructure um, um, in place. But um, you know, largely people will be charging at their home and, and charging, um, charging at work.